Ramanandanaya Om Namo Bhagavate Anjani Nandanaya Om Namo <coughs> Wonderful introduction. They're getting shorter all the time. So what we do in these workshops is we sing a little bit, then we do questions. I ask you questions, and you give me the answers. Some of the teacher trainees are being tortured over there. <laughs> All right. Anybody want to talk about anything? Okay, take a nap. Any questions or anything? What we've just been doing is called chanting. And what we're chanting is what they call the divine names. What are the divine names? What is a name? Right? A name is what we call something. And when we call that name, the thing associated with that name responds. However, in this case, we don't know what we're doing. We have no clue what these names mean, if they mean anything, where the hell they came from. But we're doing it anyway. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> but actually, it's not much crazier than anything else we do. Because the rest of the time, we only think we know what we're doing. Everybody knows thinking is not what it seems to be. So, the reason these names are called divine name or the sacred names or the names of God is that these names originated, they came from somewhere, right? They came from somewhere. Someone brought this name to our consciousness. And the beings that brought these names to our consciousness were great saints, great realized beings who had an experience and of a deeper reality. And when they came back to this reality, uh, this is what they called that experience. Ram, Krishna, Kali, Shiva, Allah. This is the name they gave to that experience. So when they used that name, that experience was brought back to them, in a sense. And they started teaching people these names as a method to invoke that experience or invoke that state of being. So right away we can see that these names don't mean on the deepest level, they don't mean some thing, some concept that we can think about. These names are like a, a key that opens up a door to a deeper awareness. And 
the awareness that it opens up to is actually our own true nature, who we really are, underneath all the things we think we are, which is a lot of things, because all we do is think all day long. All day long. And then that energy spins off into dreams and we wake up in the morning and we keep thinking. We wake up in the morning, we start writing, producing, directing and acting in the movie of me. Me, all day long, me, me, me. Where am I gonna go? Do they like me? Is my hair too short? Is my hair too long? Should I wear this? Should I wear that? What should I do? Should I go there? Should I go there? Maybe if I do this, I'll be happy. That's what we do all day long. And the funny thing about it is that we actually believe everything we think. I mean, think about it. We actually believe everything we think. Right now you're thinking, this guy is out of his goddamn mind. And you believe that. Why? Why do you believe it when you say, I'm no good. That person will never love me. I'm not worthy of that. I'm no good. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not this enough. We believe all these stories we tell ourselves all day long, all life long. And mostly we don't get a break. And we keep, like a kid playing on the sand, we keep rearranging the stuff. Well, I'll make it look this way. How's that? Oh, but then the wave comes and washes it away. Hmm, that didn't work. And we can't seem to stop, can we? We can't seem to stop. And when we run into difficult situations, it's very hard to deal with them. So, this practice of chanting and yoga in general is designed to open up a place within us, a deeper place in our own hearts, a deeper, more comfortable, more familiar place in our own hearts, a place where we really sit within ourselves. This is not on the level of thought, this is not on the level of emotions, this is being. And this is experienced by what's called, what could be called, intuition or knowing, immediate knowing, like Swami was talking the other night. I don't know if you all were here for the question and answer. These things are understood and experienced not by knowing up here, intellectual understanding, but by feeling an intuitive rightness about them. And you can't coerce that to happen because we don't, we, we, there's no connection between who we think we are and, and who we really are. Other than that, uh, who we really are is always here, even when we think other things, even when we're not paying attention. For instance, you're driving, right? You're going from point A to point B, and you're listening to music, and the kids in the back seat are screaming and fighting. So you're yelling, you're listening to the music, you're driving, but you're not aware that you're driving. You've, you've lost awareness that you're actually driving, but it still happens. So on the sa in the same way, that automatic unconscious driving is really being taking place, being uh, run by the ever-present being, always being here in this. Because if it depended on us to keep things together, how could, how could that be? We think one thing one moment, we think another thing another moment. And yet when we look in the mirror, we're still basically looking at the same blob. So chanting is a practice that trains us to let go of our thoughts. 
when you practice, when you do this practice, the instruction is very simple. At least the way I teach it, the way I share it. You sing, and as soon as you notice you're thinking and not paying attention or spacing out, you sing. That's the whole thing. Nothing more is required. No visualization is required. No, no manipulation of the emotions is required. What your, your experience is not about you. Your experience is simply to remember to pay attention and sing. And let go of whatever you're thinking. And little by little, it gets easier and more comfortable to let go because we start spending more time in a more relaxed, comfortable place within our own hearts, within our own being. And like all practices, it only works if you do it. You don't do it, nothing's going to happen. So, that's what it's about. I don't talk about what I, people ask me, what do you, what do you feel when you sing? I, I don't know. Why would you ask me? <laughs> I'm not paying attention to what I feel. I'm paying attention to Sitaram. Everything I feel or think or is just something to let go of for that period of practice. And that period of practice is when we make our best effort to pay attention and to do the practice with as much uh, dedication as we can, or devotion as we can. Devotion isn't something you, you crank up when you light some flames and jump up and down. Devotion is, is a way of being, a way of being where you dedicate your whole life to waking up, to finding real love. Because you recognize that what you, the places you've been looking for that, it's not there. And when you find that love, then you find it everywhere. Because you're seeing it in here. You're seeing through the eyes of love and everything you see will be love. Or truth or peace or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> As, uh, chanting is like asanas for the mind and heart. Just, just as you get more comfortable in an asana, the longer you do it, and the deeper you go into it, these chants begin to um, also feel more comfortable the more you, you do the chanting. You actually begin to find that uh, a sense of uh, being at home or, or uh, an inner kind of well-being starts to arise. This is something that we, we don't know a lot about, well-being. A simple sense of okayness. It's all right, I'm all right. Not telling yourself, I'm all right. I once had a friend who had signs all over her house, you know. I'm all right, I'm strong, I'm brilliant, I can do it, I can take it, you know. And when I walked in, I started to cry, you know. Because I could see she needed those signs because that's exactly what she didn't feel about herself. So she was trying to, with mental energy, she was trying to hold on to the idea of being strong. But it was coming from great damage, great emotional damage. And that damage wasn't being examined and wasn't being healed because there was so much fear. So through these practices, we get a little bit more relaxed about stuff. 
Because, for instance, if you're feeling, uh, the, um, imagine that you get the ability to let go of any emotion or thought that kind of comes in, any cloud that floats in, right? Let's say somebody looked at you weird this morning and you just kind of freaked you out, right? So you kind of like keep going over and over in your head like, what the fuck is that person? Why is he talking? Why did he look at me that way? And it doesn't stop. It keeps going around and around and around. Then you get angry. Then you get pissed. Then you get sad. Then you get revengeful. You know, there's a certain amount of juice involved in that and it's going gonna, it's gonna to work itself out. Play itself out. Okay, so you're sitting here now, and we're doing Sitaram, and you're still going on about that, right? This is causing you pain. This is burning you. It's burning your mind. It's burning in your mind. It's not very pleasant, is it? So, through this practice, we get the ability to just let go of it and come back to the chanting. Well, then it might be back. We let go again. Eventually, we get tremendous confidence in the ability to let go of any storyline that that's grabbing us and any storyline that's hurting us. And there's a hell of a lot of them. We're swimming in a soup of miserable storylines. And we call that life. But we don't see what's really who made the soup and we don't see how to get out of it. So through these practices, we get the strength to deal with anything right? Anything. And it's an amazing feeling not to have to be afraid of your life. Not to have to make walls. Not to have to protect yourself. To enter every day, every moment like, hey, what's up? Just here. That comes from practice. That comes from doing practice and learning to do it wholeheartedly as time goes on. That's what this is all about. Becoming a good human being. A human being that can ex extend compassion and kindness to everything in its way, everything in its life. And if there's fear, if there's unprocessed emotion like anger and guilt and shame and all that stuff we carry around with us, we are not able to be kind and caring to other people on a deep level. We can still step over the bum in the street instead of kicking him, but that's about it. So how to become who we really know that we are underneath all that stuff? Only practice will do that. Anything else you do along with practice to help yourself is good. Therapy, counseling, all these things are great. But the strength to let go and to the strength to sit more deeply in yourself comes through practice. Because there's no intellectual stuff going on. You, you're doing it, you let go, you do it more. Did I bum everybody out now? Yeah, the good news and the bad news. Nobody can do it for you. That's the good news and the bad news. You have to do it. And no one can do it for you. The greatest guru that ever lived can't do it for you. They might be able to show you what's possible. But you still got to take the steps yourself. They may show you where to go and how to get there. But you have to take every step yourself. They may be holding you up invisibly behind you, but you have to take the steps.
as time goes on, these names will, will, will kind of go on by themselves inside you. And in those moments where one thought stops and you kind of have a free moment, you'll become aware of the flow of these names going on. And at that moment, you have an option to go into that for a while, to spin that wheel. Every, every Krishna says in the Gita that every, even the smallest little action in the direction opposite from the flow of unconscious life is a very big thing. Every time you come back for just a second while you're chanting, it's a very, very big, important thing, a powerful thing. And it may not feel like that right now, just like if you're flying at 20,000 feet, a huge house on the, on the ground doesn't look very big. But as you come down to earth, that house starts to look very big. As we get here, more and more here, more and more present in our lives, these moments when we come back, they, they begin to look very important. I want to ask you about inner peace. Do you have to achieve... Rich, turn this up, okay? Can you, can you hear me? Okay. I want to ask you about inner peace. So in order to achieve... A little feedback there. Deafness. There we are. Good. Okay. <laughs> in order to achieve this moment where your mind is clear, mm -hmm. do you need to first achieve inner peace, or does that lead to inner peace? Mind is always clear. It's just clouded up by thoughts. Mind is always clear. Where's the mind? Show me. Yeah, right. You can't. Mind is, is always clear. It's like the sky. The sky is always clear. There might be clouds going through it. There might be pollution. But the essence of the sky is clarity. There's always clearness. So, which is why all we have to do is let go of the thought to re-experience for a second that spaciousness, that space of, of no thinking, of being. But it comes right back right away because there's billions of thoughts, like the waves out there. Right? There's wave after wave after wave after wave, and every single those, one of those waves has been caused by some movement. right? Just like every one of our thoughts has been caused by some karma of us, uh, that we ourselves have performed. And they're coming, and they're coming, and they're coming, and there doesn't seem to be an end to them. But when you become a Buddha, there is no more thought. But until then, thoughts may keep coming. That doesn't mean you're identified with them all the time. You do reach a stage where thoughts no longer grab you. They may still be coming. It's just like sometimes you look up at the sky, you don't notice the clouds going through. All right? But they're there. So at some point, in, you know, somewhere about between here and Buddhahood, wasn't that a Bob Hope movie? The Road to Buddhahood? <laughs> All right, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Um, so the thought, don't think of the mind as something that exists, uh, that, that mind isn't just thoughts, lots of thoughts. Mind is the pure awareness of being in which the thoughts cruise through. And we, the, our individual awareness gets stuck on those thoughts because we're attached. We, we think we are who we think we are and those are the thoughts that we think we are. So that's why all you have to do is start the mantra, listen to the mantra, and as soon as you notice that one of those thoughts got you, you're actually already, it's already let go of you by the time you notice it got you. You see, otherwise you couldn't have noticed that it got you. Otherwise you'd just be dreaming, daydreaming. So once you notice you're daydreaming, you're already back at that moment, instead of going back into daydreaming, you, rem you remember the mantra. That movement towards the mantra away from the daydreaming is a very big, that's practice right there. That's the practice. That's all you have to do. But you can't, 
the one thing we can't do is stop thinking. How do you stop thinking? Where is the thought that you're going to shoot it and kill it and, and stop thinking? You only notice your thinking when you're no longer thinking the same way. Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. You only notice when you're thinking when, you've, when you're not thinking exactly the same way. When you go, oh, Jesus, I've, I've just driven 300 miles and I've been, I haven't even seen the road for three hours. Isn't, doesn't that happen all the time? At that moment, please watch the road. So that's the idea. And through the, repet through the constant repetition of the name and, and the and the gradual is paying more and more attention to them. You, the mo that moment where you, sh where you normally would have gone back into the daydream, that moment becomes the moment where you wake up a little bit, where you become more present for a second. But then you're gone again. And you don't know you're gone until you notice you're gone. That moment you come back. So then you, you reestablish the mantra again. You remember the mantra. It's all about remembering. Remembering. There's nothing else to do. You know, you can cultivate all kinds of things and practice all kinds of things, but essentially, it all, it's all based on remembering and paying attention. It's not easy. Many years ago, before I went to India, I <clears throat> was up in the mountains in New Mexico for the winter. And uh, we heard about a, a New York artist who had gone to India and uh, had come back and moved to further down this mountain in New Mexico. And, apparently, and he was supposed to be a teacher of some kind. So we went down to visit him. And um, we hung out with him for the afternoon, and then I just sat in the back and was just kind of watching what was going on. Everybody else was asking questions. <clears throat> and then as we were leaving, I happened to be the last guy out the door. And he grabbed me, and he says, you, you have to find out why it is you can't give yourself 100% to whatever you're doing. I felt like one of those squirrels on the wall of a taxidermy shop, you know, nailed to the wall. He, he nailed me, right? Because that was my, that was, at that time in my life, that was <clears throat> really something I was noticing brutally about myself, is that I could never really get into anything. I was always like, eh, eh, eh. I could never, even when I was doing stuff, there was always holding back. And it's, I've been working with that issue from, you know, my whole life, even today. Same thing. Because it's the same thing with practice. Maharaj used to say, go on, sing your false lying Ram Ram. He said, one of these days you'll say it right once. Boom, you're out of here. What does that mean, right? It means with full, wholehearted presence. Really, you've gathered all parts of yourself from years and years of practice, maybe, maybe lifetimes of practice, and then Ram, boom. But that's not something we can make happen with your little I, little me will, your little personal will. All the will can do is help you remember to remember. And from the remembering, from the from the learning to live in the moment more deeply through doing practice, things happen. Inside, all everything you need to know is already within us. It's actually who we are. Already. There's nothing you're going to add on that's going to make it better. Nothing. It's already complete and full. We just don't know where to look for it, which is what practice does. It turns our gaze away from the outer world to the inner reality. Right now, our awareness is locked into it, to the messages and the flow coming from our senses, our sensory apparatus. 
That's all we know right now. Gradually, that awareness is turned and brought within. That's when you see, oh, the sky has always been the sky. This is something that you will experience one lifetime or another. You have to because that's the way it works. So, the, the issue is, is how do we marshal our forces right now in this life? How do we gather up our, uh, our desire to find reality, to find real happiness, real love? How do we get in touch with that to help us get through the day? That's the real issue. Because we don't really believe any of this shit's going to work. If we did, it, it already worked. We believe the stories we tell ourselves about everything. And those stories don't end by themselves. We must end them by not paying attention to them, by letting go of them every time we notice we're stuck in one. And don't wait until you're really depressed and sick and screwed up to start doing practice because that won't work. You have to do practice when you can, which is now, not later. Over here. Where's the mic? Oh, let's just do right behind you, then we'll come over here. Right behind you. Hi, Hi Krishna Das. Um, Hi. It's kind of a personal question, but I think a lot of people can relate to it. And it's about um, understanding or feeling a connection to the soul of a loved one who has left their body. Um, my, my father left his body 11 years ago today, right around now. And um, I've been struggling these years um, because I felt like at first that his, and, I, and maybe you're, from what you've learned from the masters that you've been with, maybe you can shed some light on this. Um, um, I, I, I wonder, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, for a while, I felt that my, my father's soul was hanging around very close to me and that I wasn't letting him be free and leave. And uh, I, I got a puja done where I actually felt like it gave my father some freedom, my father's soul. Mm -hmm. But then I, I, I had other concerns that, that he was going to disappear from, from my realm, you know, being connected to me in, in my realm. And I just wonder about when you speak and pray to someone you love who is not in their body, I, I feel a connection when I, I pray to deities and God and, and you know, Krishna who, you know, is here, but with my father I, I, I question, I don't know how strong the connection is and, what, and what's really happening, if, if that makes any sense. I'm not sure it does, <laughs> but still. Uh, in, other in terms words, of making sense, I mean, like when we pray, when we pray to someone we love, when we pray to, are they hearing? Are they hearing it? Is are they getting that that love? I guess that's what I really want to know. I don't know, and mostly nobody knows. All we can know is our own experience. So if you pray and offer love to your father, and you feel it. That's pretty good. What, you can't even know what the guy in front of you is feeling. How are you going to know what somebody who's left the body is going to feel? What you can know is what you feel, and those are the, that's where you should make the offerings. Love never dies. Bodies come and go. That they've been coming and going ever since they first came. The bodies of the greatest saints that ever lived, they're gone too. 
Krishna's body is gone. Ram's body is gone. Right? So that's the way it is. But the love is always here. And if you feel that love, that's a very good thing. It's a very positive thing for you. Uh, and they say that, that it helps the beings who have moved on out of this body, out of this realm. If we have, a, if we, if we have that loving relationship with them, not a, a confused, damaged, emotionally uh, uh, damaged relationship. It helps if, and, you, uh, and if you feel that love, then that's a positive thing. They say it's good for those beings like that. So, I mean, it's you who remembering your father. And, if you rem and when you remember him, if it's a good feeling, then that's, there's nothing, you know, that's all you need to know. You can never know where he is now, where that soul is now. See, you, we also use these words that we don't know what the hell they mean, you know, like soul. Uh, who knows? Do you know? Do I know what soul mean, really means? You know? I mean, so your father, you say, had a soul. Well, you have a soul, but do you know your own soul? No. I don't know mine either. So what we know is what we know in our world, and you have your father in your memory and in your emotional memory and in your heart and your life, and that's the father you deal with. Where his soul is, does that mean he can't be in two places at once? We don't know that. Uh, does that mean he couldn't be reincarnated in China and still you would feel connected to him? We don't know. All we can know is this, and that's a lot. So if you have that kind of good feeling, especially all these years later, my, my, it's the same with my father. My dad died in 2008. I feel him all the time. Is it really him? How do I know? But it makes me feel good. You know? That's enough. Because you can't, the things we can't know, we can't know. So, but you, that would be a very, that's a, that love that you feel when you think of him is, is a very good thing to breathe in and out of, to, to expand it, right? To really make it deeper and stronger and be with it. Don't just take it as, not a lot of people feel those things for their parents. So that's a very good thing. Mostly we have a lot of conflicted emotions about our parents. So. Anyway. It's your experience that's important. That's what I'm saying. And to trust that experience and not ask more of it than, than is necessary. Don't ask questions of it that no one can answer. Be happy with it. Hello. Hello? <laughs> I was wondering if you're um, active so, um, in any issues socially especially environmentally, and if you can speak toward, is it all supposed to just be inner work? There's, you know, there's so many social problems. It feels especially environmentally right now, mm -hmm. and I'm feeling very sad about everything going on out here in the world, and you know, pollution coming in every which direction, and mm -hmm. genetically modified foods, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you personally are contributing toward any social justice or, and, and if you could speak toward how to balance that with inner practices and outer practices. I try not to rob any banks one thing. <laughs> or, or hurt people. Um, social issues, yeah. Um, see, within the way you said you're sad about things in the world, it's one thing to, to to see what's going on in the world, which is a mess. 
But it's another thing to allow that to destroy your own happiness. You shouldn't do that. Partially is we don't feel we have the right to be happy if everything's so screwed up. But that's not true. And if you don't find a way to be happy, then we've let the world rule our lives. It's been like this since day one. You know, The world is always fucked up. That's what the world is. There's always people killing other people. There's always people greedy, taking things that aren't theirs, that they shouldn't take, that forces other people to experience extreme poverty and suffering. That's human nature, a part of human nature. And it's part of your nature, too. You're a human. But if you really want to spread love in the world, then you have to have love. So do whatever you do out there, whatever social services you do, but don't ignore finding what's inside of you. I do all kinds of stuff, but I don't really think about it much and I don't talk about it much. It's just not anybody's business. It's not even my business. It just happens. So, but mostly I sing because that's what I do. And that's my service to myself and to anybody else who wants to sing. And through the chanting, I get a lot of strength to do a lot of things that I might not have had otherwise. I, I found ways to do things in the world that I hadn't been able to do. So, when you realize that everything you do affects everybody else in the, in the universe, because we're all interconnected, then you start to clean up your game. And the first place to clean up is your own room. You can't invite people over if your room's a mess. You can't provide a safe haven for people if you, if you don't have one, if you don't live in one. So you can do, you have to do, to some degree I think it's more, it, it, helping other people and doing social work is, is a natural extension of spiritual practice. Because when you feel better, there's more openness, there's more giving, there's more ability to deal with and see what's going on around you and have some, something to offer to that. You know, um, you, you can't end war with anger. You can't end war by hurting people. You know, it's just, it's not going to work. You end war by finding love. And uh, on a one-to-one -one person basis, you know. And then when you have a good something inside, then you can share that with other people. And you will, because it's natural for you to do that. People who go around trying to save the world and, and, and then beat up their kids and kick the dogs, I mean, I don't, it doesn't work for me. So... If you really want to do good in the world, or which means create sattva, you must remove the rajas and tamas from your being, which is not easy. But if you're working on it consciously, then you begin to see how difficult it is for even other people who aren't working on it consciously to act in a good way. You begin to feel some compassion for those people. And that feeling of compassion for other people will do more to change the world than any righteous anger will ever do. Just the feeling of compassion. It doesn't mean you have to do anything about it. That feeling is like a scent that goes out and people respond to that. It's like, it's like a, a breeze that blows over people. But you must be in it yourself. You can't fake it. So, you know, do whatever it is you do. But it's the way you do what you do that's important. I remember, um, I mean, John Lennon used to talk about, you know, all we are saying is give peace a chance. And he was a cranky, nasty, angry drug addict for a long time. And that's the truth. He wasn't a fun guy. He wasn't a peaceful guy. How is he going to talk about peace? And, and, and he inspired so much anger on the outside world by the way he tried to make peace in the world. 
You know, the Dalai Lama doesn't inspire that kind of anger, except from China. But that's part of the game. So Dalai Lama is busy all the time doing good, but there's nobody in there doing anything. Somebody said to him, uh, "Your Holiness, why does everybody love you so much?" You know. And he said, oh, "I don't know." He said, "But maybe it's because I spent my whole life caring about and considering the happiness of others." Let me say that again. Because I spent my whole life from being a, from a child cultivating compassion and caring about considering the happiness of others. There's nothing else in there at this point except compassion. There's nobody being compassionate. It's a big difference. It's the difference between the Salvation Army and a Buddhist monk, you know? There's nobody doing anything. They've become compassionate. Everything they do is compassionate. The Dalai Lama isn't running the bathroom and go, I'm the Dalai Lama, I'm the Dalai Lama, I'm Dalai Lama. There's nobody in there being compassionate. There's only this compassion generating machine, kind of. A machine that's made out of love. And he does more good in one billionth of a second than all the do gooders in the world will ever do. But you still have to do what you feel called to do. You shouldn't not do it. But you should always recognize that. To be really effective in the world, one must be really effective in dealing with one's own stuff. Otherwise, you just, you're just uh, using that as an excuse not to deal with yourself. They call it idiot compassion. It means you're trying to be compassionate to other people, but you're not compassionate to yourself. How can that work? Um, more practical question. Um, you were telling about the practice, and um, I was just wondering, is there, or what in your opinion is the difference then of, say, like meditating or reciting a mantra and actually chanting, like singing? When you chant it out loud, you have an opportunity to give other people headaches. <laughs> when you're silent, it doesn't bother anybody. It's terrible. Um, ultimately, there's no difference. The reason we chant out loud is twofold. It helps us pay attention. And it, uh, it gives other people an opportunity to hear the name because they, people who know these things truly believe. And this is something you'll have to take on faith, just like as if you're in Catholic school right now. They say that every, he, he, every hearing or every single repetition of one of these names is a seed that will take, will grow within you without fail at some time. It's, it's the ultimate good seed. There's nothing, there's no negativity involved with, with this practice of chanting. These names. There are mantras that you can chant for anything. There are mantras for finding buried treasure. There are mantras for robbing banks. There are mantras for growing to be 6'3", 240 pounds. There's mantras for becoming Miss America or Miss India, as the case may be. There's mantras for everything. But there's, those kind of mantras are very, uh, uh, very selfish, personal, me, me oriented mantras. And those mantras you need to be initiated in in order for them to work. Somebody has to give you the juice with the mantra in order for you to, rec to realize the truth of that mantra, which might be to become president of the United States. The Dalai Lama was just with uh, Obama yesterday. How cool. That's why he became president, so he could see the Dalai Lama this life. No doubt about it. Otherwise, he would have never met him. He'd just been a senator. So, um, once again, it's all medit uh, this practice is meditation. Chanting is meditation. But when you do it like this, it includes other people which is good for them and might be good for the person singing too. Might be. It depends how the person's, you know, what the person who's singing wants. So that's a whole other thing. We're not talking about that. But uh, meditation, 
Meditation is a big word. There's so many different levels and kinds, uh, types of meditation that we can't even begin to discuss it. What we're talking about here is the very most basic trying to, trying to get somewhere between our ears and pay a little bit of attention. So that's what we're calling meditation. But meditation is, is like that gentleman asked, is our natural state, like the sky, is the mind. It's always there. But we don't see the sky, we just see the stuff that's in the sky. Because we've been trained to look at the stuff. Everybody we've ever known has looked at the stuff. Our teachers taught us how to discern which is the good stuff, which is the bad stuff. Everybody we've ever known has just been dealing with stuff. Nobody looks at the sky, nobody sees the sky. So nobody sees the mind in which all this stuff happens. The space in which all this stuff happens. So it's the same like you were just saying, which I can't remember what you said. But it's, uh, this is meditation. This is meditation. Namaste. Hi. I would like to know if you're willing to share the most memorable transformations in the your most life. most mem memorable? To you. Most memorable transformation of yourself. Because you obviously have changed. The, from mo the moment I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many big moments, really. Uh, but the first really big moment that I can remember was the moment I met Ramdas, which was in the winter of '68. He had just come back from India. He had sp spent about six months in India, and he'd spent a few months in the temple uh, and had met Maharaji. And. Uh, I heard about him from some friends, so I went up to, I drove up to New Hampshire from New York, upstate New York, to see him. And the moment I walked into the room where he was sitting, without a word being spoken, I hardly even saw him, I just walked into the room, I knew that whatever it is I was looking for was real. It existed. It was in the world. It could be found. And not a word was spoken. And just like that. That was a big moment. Thanks. That's powerful. <laughs> Hello. Oh, it's so nice to see your face. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the difference between compassion versus internalizing other people's sadness. Like having compassion for someone's issues versus taking them on. What do you mean by taking them on? Um, like, I'm, I mean, I have a sick brother. I'm sure we all have sick people or people who are suffering in our lives. So the difference in being able to have compassion for somebody versus feeling like you're suffering with them. Hmm. Well, it's not our world, you know. We're not running it. Somebody else seems to be running it and they're not picking up the phone. So all we can do is be with situations as best we can without closing down, without pulling back, without trying to hide from all the different aspects of a situation. You know? When somebody's really ill like that, um, you, you do everything you can to help. You don't know how it's going to work out. Nobody does. You don't know why a person is ill, why it's happening. This is not our realm to ask even those questions, you know. Um, it's like Krishna says in the Gita, you do what you do, but you leave the fruits of your actions, the results of your actions, 
aren't your problem. You leave those to me. You do what you do. You care about this person, you help this person, you feel for this person. But it's not your job to change the karmas of the situation. So learning to accept that gives you some space to be you and not to internalize that person's pain. Um, you know, it's impossible almost, not, not that. You're walking into the room filled with it and then you, 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 it sticks to you as you go, but then you have to kind of just sit and relax and let go of it again and again and not allow it to um, hurt you. That's not the point of this person's illness, isn't to hurt you. So it would be not in his best interest or your best interest to, to indulge yourself with those kind of emotions. Now, we can't prevent the emotions from arising. It's natural. But at some point you have to recognize, you know, you have to look at that and, and let it go. It doesn't mean you're not caring about the person. Uh, it actually means you're caring more because indulging is just your own ego trip. Me, me, me. I feel this way. I feel so bad, 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 bad. That's all that's yours. It's not about you. It's about him. So to be really present with that person means that you won't get caught in those emotions in a negative way, in a dark way. That you can feel them, you can recognize them, but to really be able to be there with the person, look them right in the eyes, you know, like we're here, whatever, we're here, then you have to be able to keep letting go of the, that natural tendency to, to, to get emotional about those things. And it's, it's a total human thing, there's no, nothing wrong with it. But the great saints, they feel all our pain, but they don't feel it the same way we feel it. One time, Maharaj was on the roof of the temple with another old devotee who I knew very well, and he told me that all of a sudden Maharaj says, oh, Mrs. So-and-so, who was his old devotee from different, far away town, oh, she's just died, she's died. And he was like dancing in ecstasy. So this other devotee said, you butcher. She served you for so many years, and look at you, you're dancing in ecstasy when she dies. And Maharaji looks at him and he said, what? You want me to act like one of the puppets, like you? Maharaji, he knew who was dying, who was being born. He knew why. He knew everything. He knew past, present, and future. And we can't expect a being like that to be as stupid as we are, you know? There's no way. They're not going to be. They know everything. So... He just laughed. And it wasn't mean he didn't feel it. He knew where she was going to take birth in the next minute. So why should he worry about this body? But we're stuck here with what we think we know. And that's where all our unhappiness comes from. We think we know. We're not, and it's, it's unconscious believing the storylines we've been fed about by the culture we've been born into. If we'd been born in India in certain circumstances, we might have been, we might have a different outlook on things. Now they have their problems, there's no question about it. But on the other hand, they have an ability to deal with uh, suffering in a way that the West, we have, we have this thing, uh, suffering is wrong, I shouldn't be feeling any pain. Life is bad, this is wrong. Excuse me? You know? It's, I don't think so. This is just one of the way things is, the way things are. In India, in the East, they kind of understand that in a certain kind of way. Stuff comes, stuff goes. You know, the sun rises, the sun sets. It's very hard to, to really um, expand our being, our hearts, so much to, uh, to be wide enough to feel it, but not be taken over by it. When you have a heart as wide as the world, Everything, there's room for everything in there. The, the good, the bad, the dark, the light. And it's, you're not clamping down on it. It has room to come, it has room to go, it has room to be. 
you have a different, you're moving through life in a different way. The third patriarch of Zen said, the great way is not difficult for those with no preferences. Well, here we are. <laughs> Guess what? We are nothing but preferences and, and that's all, you know, likes and dislikes. That's all we do all day. I like this, I don't like that, I like this, I don't like that, I like this. We're just constantly in that place judging every, everything that's coming towards us, whether it's acceptable or unacceptable, or it feels good, it feels bad. This is insanity. But that's what they take for sanity here in the West. Because everybody's like that. So, yeah, you know, the emotion is actually preventing you from really feeling, really being with him. You know? It's a program running on top of really being with him. And when you can really be with him, you're making a space for him to enter into, too. Where he can release his storyline a little bit. And that's a good thing for him. I have a question, something that's kind of confused me. Um, Hold the mic up a little bit. Something that's confused me a little bit about the Eastern teachings. I'm, I'm sure that makes two of us, <laughs> at least. Okay, so we talked about it this morning even about the senses and the things that appeal to the senses that, that we shouldn't be interested in things that I, appeal to the senses. I didn't say that. I don't know. <laughs> if you heard that, that's your story. Okay. I didn't say we shouldn't be attracted to the things of the senses. I simply pointed out the fact that our awareness is right now flowing out through the senses and we're absorbed in the sense, sensory experience and that uh, that's limited to the five senses and that there's more than that and as soon as we can turn our awareness and kind of pull it back from that unconscious flowing through the fingers and the eyes and the ears we begin to experience something different inside. I never said should. I don't use that word. Okay. Um, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about the sensualist and the things that would appeal to the sensualist. Yeah, I, I got my list too. It's, okay. I got my list from the Bhagavad Gita. And I'm just asking, um, you know, because I try to think about that as well, and mm -hmm. I think music is very sense-oriented mm -hmm. uh, a thing very much of the senses and yeah. that's the reason I got on an airplane in Los Angeles and came out here mm -hmm. and um, so I'm just trying to understand I mean we, the Buddha who um, went through the asceticism process where I'm assuming that music wouldn't have been part of it because it is part of the senses so I just wanted you to explain how that connects how that yeah. goes together Music is a very wonderful thing, and it, uh, it can calm us down. It can give us some peace. No question, it's very beautiful. I love music, all kinds of music. Um, but if music was enough of itself, certainly every musician would be happy. I don't think that's the case. So... You see, it's not that these things are bad, it's that they don't really work, that's all. And they're okay as long as you don't expect them to work. You don't, when you, when you put on uh, your headphones and play your favorite CD, you don't expect that it's gonna last forever. Unless it happens to be one of my CDs. You don't expect, you, when, when you take a bite of that chocolate chip cookie, you don't expect that that pleasure will last forever, right? However, unconsciously, all of us keep grabbing for more and more pleasures so we can have those pleasurable experiences, not recognizing the kind of unconscious anxiety that's behind the grabbing for pleasure. Right? Because all we've ever been taught is about pleasure. So music is an incredible pleasure, a very powerful pleasure. But 
it doesn't bring permanent, ultimate joy. It brings temporary, it has a temporary effect. It can make some people angry and some people happy. The same music, if you play it loud enough. Right? So it's a personal experience with the experience you're having. Music in this situation is used to help bring the mind, quiet the mind, and bring us all together in the same space. But then we add to it the names, these mantras. Because these mantras have an unlimited possibility, which, which, doesn't, which is different than, than any sensual experience. So, I'm not a swami, I'm not a renunciate, I don't frown on sensory experiences, but I try not to expect them to last forever. So I'm not disappointed when they change, because everything's always changing. So that's really all it is. So you enjoy it when you're in it. But then what do you do when it's over? You grab for the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then you're dead. Now what? Right? So this is the issue. There's nothing wrong with these experiences, but they don't. Maharaji said, he said, you like to smoke hash? Great. Let's go in a big room together and we'll smoke hash forever. The only thing is it doesn't work. It doesn't last. He said, the only thing that lasts is love, real love. See, love, the way we talk about it mostly, is between two things. It might be two people. It might be a dog and a person or a cat and a person. It might be a cat and a dog. But it's between things. That's not real love. Real love is who we are. It doesn't come from anything out there. It doesn't need the right button to be pushed to feel. It's the sky that we don't see because we're looking at the clouds. It's always here. Real love. So, which is interesting because, you know, if you try to, to, uh, push away sensory experience, you wind, up, you wind up getting very cranky because we're not really ready to look within. We, we don't know how to look within, so to speak, to use a phrase, look within. And so we wind up starving to death, <laughs> you know? And that's not healthy either. You need a certain amount of experience to recognize that, well, maybe this is not going to work the way I want. Maybe this is really not going to give me everything I want. There must be some other thing I could do. But it doesn't mean pushing that stuff away necessarily. When you see it clearly, then you're no longer involved in it the same way. When you eat a bowl of pasta, you don't expect it to last forever. You know you're going to be hungry again. But it doesn't quite dawn on us what that means, you know? We think that, and what, the reason is that because we don't really know what's possible. We don't, we really don't know what's possible in life. We hope that the stuff we read about in those books could be true, but we don't really believe it yet. And so we're stuck going from pleasure to pleasure, thing to thing because that's the only thing that's worked for us so far. So that's the issue, that's the space we're in, which is why it's pretty tricky. Which is why I share this practice the way I do. Sing, when you notice you're not paying attention, sing. Because what you need to know must come from within you. It can't come from any other place. That understanding, that, that opening, that... Uh, epiphany about what might be possible, that you might really be able to be in love all the time, that you might actually be love, that peace, peace of mind might actually be possible no matter what you're doing in the world. This is the thing we don't understand. 
And you know, some, there's some way that we think that happiness is in some limited quantity, and if she's got it, there's less for me. So we don't like to see people happy. You, ever, you, know, that, you, you know about frogs? You put these frogs, frogs, crabs, you put crabs in a big pail, bucket by the water, you catch a bunch of f crabs, and they'll gradually start to crawl up, crawl up. And one will get very close to the top, and the other ones will drag it down. It's unbelievable. They're less, they're less concerned with getting, getting out themselves and making sure nobody else gets out. It's amazing. So, yeah, just a second. So, um, music is great, and it helps us it helps us gather ourselves and calm ourselves and be more present and uh, soothes the savage beast temporarily. But it's only what, what we call practice that's going to actually add the other dimension to it that makes, that gives it a lasting quality. So I've been doing some reading about Maharaji and I'm just curious about how did he become so perceptive and attain such enlightenment? Like, where did that come from? How the hell do I know? <laughs> if I knew, you know, I'd be, I'd be levitating now, talking to you from the clouds up there. But I can tell you what he said. He said, Ram Nam Karnese Sabpura Hojata. From the repetition of these names, everything will be made complete and full. That's what he said. And when we said, Baba, how do we find God? He said, serve people. Excuse me? What do you mean, serve them for lunch? What do you mean, serve people? So he said, well, how do you raise, you know, Kundalini? He said, feed people. That's what he said. So that's the word from somebody who made it. Care about people, feed people, and remember the name. He didn't say, don't listen to music. <laughs> he didn't say, don't do a lot of other things that some people say you shouldn't do. He said, do those things, and don't worry about it. It's a very difficult teaching. We, have, we kept wanting him to give us some practice, you know? To tell me what I can do, you know, what I should do to like save my ass. He didn't see it that way. He didn't see it that way. He, he didn't encourage us to think about ourselves all the time. So not that we needed any encouragement. It was completely opposite to that. Do some Ram Nam and, and, and think about other people. Take care of people. Live your life. Be happy. What? I, I don't get it. Very difficult teaching. But he wasn't a teacher. He was a Siddha. A Siddha is someone who does, not teaches. He would change your life not talk to you about changing your life or teach you how to change your life. He'd just change it. He'd remove obstacles. He'd do things. He'd bring things into your life that weren't there. He'd cure illnesses. He's raised the dead. He does everything. And he doesn't teach about it. And when he does teach, he says silly little things like just keep repeating the name. So you think that's silly, right? But can you think of how much, think of one day, okay? Let's even forget about trying to remember the name. How many breaths are you aware of in a 24-hour period? Right. But nonetheless, those breaths are going in and out all day long. We don't pay any attention. So if we just could pay a little attention to our own breath, which is going on by itself, it doesn't need any help from us, through the, through the course of a day, 
that amount of concentration, we'd probably be walking on the moon in a week. So then you add to that to try to repeat the name, keep the name going on all day long and by doing practice. It's very difficult because we're too busy. We're too busy. We're too busy and we're not hungry enough, period. You can't make yourself hungry. When you hit the shit in life, you'll get hungry all of a sudden for practice. Until then, pretend. Pretend you're meditating. Pretend you're chanting. When something really difficult happens, you'll be chanting. For your life, you'll be chanting. And that will work. There's no, you can't fool anybody. Who are you going to fool? Yourself? Well, we do that all the time. We think. Just have to live and be a good person. That takes a lot of effort, a lot of very difficult practice to become a good human being. Very difficult. Someone who thinks about others at least as much as they think about themselves. It's, it's impossible. One time, uh, Maharaj used to say, you know, I don't, I don't teach, I don't teach, I don't. So one time an old lady said, Baba, she comes to the temple and said, Baba, show me God. Which he could do. So he says, not now, Ma, later. So the, the lady goes in and sh to the temple and helps with the chores and stuff like that. So later in the day, the, the bus comes to pick people up, take them to the, the, back to town. So this woman comes back from the back of the temple, bows to Maharaji, and is on her way to the bus. And Maharaji says, Ma, come here, come here. I'll show you God now. And she says, no, Baba, I have to go home and take care of the family. I don't need God. And she runs out of the temple. That's how much she wanted God. It's really, we do what we want, and we don't do what we don't want. Or unless we're forced to by situations. So, but on the other hand, you've come all this distance to do these, to be a part of these retreats here and to do these practices. That's a powerful statement as well. Because there's a lot of places with air conditioning you could be right now. I don't know about a better beach, but certainly air conditioning, TV, you know, coffee. A lot of places you can be. So this is a big statement that you have all made, a movement you've made in your life to try to create some opening and some understanding and some experience of something that didn't come with the birth package. It didn't come uh, right easily and apparently as you were born and grown up. So that's a very good thing and a very positive thing. And a very... And if you think about it, there's more people in Atlantis than there are here. So, that's another thing. Most people don't give a shit about this stuff. It's not in their radar at all. They simply want to go from one pleasant thing to the next pleasant thing and try to avoid the unpleasant with as much strength as they can. And then something comes and runs them over and they pick themselves up and they do it all again. But coming here is a very different kind of statement. You come here ultimately to try to find a way to live, to find an inner strength to live with and through it, all the difficult things that will happen and do happen in life without them closing us down. Without them closing us down and making us angry, tired, bitter old people. Because that could happen. unless we find a way to live every day with an open, caring heart and also to look at our stuff and try to let go of some of that selfishness, some of that greed, some of that fear, some of that shame, some of that guilt, some of that anger, a little bit as time goes on. And we can only do that through inviting some practice into our lives on a regular basis. Not enough just to come here once a year or twice a year or even ten times a year. 
one has to take it home with, with one and start treating the people in our families better, the people at work better, the people in the bigger circles better. Because if we could do one thing, we would be gods on the earth, just one thing. And that is treating other people the way we want to be treated. That's the only thing that's required. Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. First, it's not a business deal. Okay, I'll, you know, I'll be good to you if you're good to me. No, that doesn't work. That's called a relationship. Everybody, treat them the way you want to be treated. And in order to get the strength to do that, you really have to do practice. There's no other way. Glad you came, eh? Let's sing a little bit. Okay, see you later. Namaste. So I was up in the mountains in India and uh, staying with my family. I stay with up there, the Tuari family. The youngest daughter was about 12 at the time. And um, I had heard somebody singing this song. Muderia Kahampai. Where did you get that ring? And it, it's called a bhajan and it kind of comes from the story of the Ramayana. And uh, they taught it to me, and I sang it that way for many, many years. And then I kind of lost my mind <laughs> again. I tried something else, and this is it. In the story of the Ramayana, Rama's wife Sita is stolen by the demon Ravana. And he searches for her everywhere, but he can't find her. And he's in terrible despair. Traveling through the jungle, he meets Hanuman. And seeing that Hanuman is very special, he asks her to help him find his wife, Sita. So all the monkeys travel all around the world looking for Sita, but no one can find her. And finally, there's only one place left to look, which is Ravana's kingdom called Lanka. So Hanuman finally jumps over the ocean, searches through Lanka, and he finds Sita in a, in a grove of trees, pining away for Ram. And up from above in a tree, he drops the ring that Ram gave him. So she won't be afraid, and then he starts to talk to her. Sita picks up the ring. And when she looks around, she sees this little monkey up in the tree, and she says, Where did you get that ring? I'm doing my best.
Thank you. 